continuing series of our introduction to sociology or SS 121. My name is Dr. Fawzi Mohammed, and today we shall talk about part six of our continued lecture series, which is on deviance, social control, as well as social inequality. By the end of this uh, lecture, you will have or you will be able to understand the whole concept of deviance, what it is and why it is useful for sociology. You'll also be able to understand issues pertaining to social control as well as understand the issue of social inequality. Now, beginning with deviance, what is deviance? <clears throat> or how is deviance understood by sociologists? Deviance is said to be any behavior that is recognized as violating the expected rules and norms of a society. And it is behavior that pertains to some which sort of is removed from the social expectations. If you can recall, we did talk about um, issues to do with how society socializes people from a young age in order to know the do's and don'ts and what is acceptable and what is frowned upon in order to maintain some sort of social harmony. Therefore, if one goes against these uh, expected norms and um, rules, then that person or that group of people is said to be deviating from the social, uh, socially expected rules and uh, norms. Another important concept at this juncture is stigma. Stigma is the disapproval attached to disobeying the expected norms. And uh, another important uh, concept would be crime, whereby crime is looked as or is viewed as a form of deviance in which the formal penalties are imposed by society. So we are saying that deviance is understood in reference to processes, definitions, judgments, and is not just the unusual individual acts, so to speak. Uh, we've already said or we've already established that deviance is the violation of the ever-changing social norm. Remember we also said that society is not static, it is dynamic and it is continually changing and these changes occur in different, um, uh, for different reasons and in different means and ways. So deviance is culturally dependent on the historically located and is also historically located it exists in juxtaposition to what is uh, understood or accepted as some form of normality. For example, in one culture, it may be um, considered deviant to do certain acts, while in other cultures, that may not necessarily be a deviant behavior. And the same as historical, historically located, maybe in a certain time, remember we also say sociology is interested in the historical development of mankind from the older uh, generations and the older social systems onto the more higher uh, sophisticated social systems. So maybe what was once regarded as deviant in one's historical um, uh, social system may not necessarily be regarded as deviant in another. So what is, uh, what is deviant to one group may not uh, be considered deviant in another because we know that deviance has already, is, already, is already culturally created and the cultures of people change depending on their circumstances. And then we also know that um, deviance is not necessarily just uh, a moral decision or it's not just uh, a person, an individual person who decides what is considered deviant and what is not. So, in a nutshell, deviance is socially constructed, even though, in some, uh, even though some might um, characterize it as an abnormal, uh, absolute immoral in some cases. So, who or what is defined or considered as deviant? Uh, sociologists say that both acts, in terms of an action, as well as individual, or sometimes even a whole entire groups can be defined as being deviant. Um, you, if you remember,
remember you have you ever heard the phrase condemn the sin love the sinner yeah something like that that it is the act or the action that is condemned but you love the sinner i think you but all you've heard of such uh, phrases. And sometimes uh, people refer to groups of people as being alien who to be deviant. Just because they are different from them, they have different mannerisms and characteristics and behaviors. And even sometimes people who are considered to be misfit because they don't necessarily adhere to the social fabric, the culturally prescribed do's and don'ts of a certain particular group, particular area, such also have been defined in one uh, place or another as being deviant. Also, sometimes people of low status, uh, for example, even uh, ethnic minorities or poor people, uh, they are more likely to be perceived as being deviant because due to their circumstances and their geographical and economic and social circumstances makes them to do certain things in a way that is could, consider, could necessarily be considered as being different and hence the label of being deviant. On the other hand, on the other side of the coin, people with higher status, uh, let's say for example priests or even doctors, sometimes they are likely to be, they are unlike, less likely to be defined as deviant and sometimes even when they do bad things they do they have bad actions these bad actions will, uh, society will find a way of explaining them just because they are not characteristically looked at as looked or viewed upon as being people who can be deviant or can do deviant activities and when such activities occur then society would find it in, its, in themselves to find a way to explain the reason for the deviant or the bad behavior so to speak and sometimes deviance would also be overlooked depending on situations of circumstances. Now there are a few sociological theories, as you all know sociology is full or is rich in theories and theories have been used in many ways to define, to understand and to explain certain issues, certain attributes, certain um, historical occurrences as, as far as human trying to understand the human society is concerned. In this case, there are also theories that have been used or that are in place that uh, try to understand uh, why deviance in society. So sociological theories of deviance, they search for the external social factors that may lead to deviant behavior by some, maybe sometimes individuals or even group of individuals. And these uh, theories tend to focus on the social environment as be, and also the social circumstances as being the factors that cause these people to behave in a certain way or to do things in a certain manner, hence being um, deviant. And sometimes these theories also look at the reaction of people towards uh, others who have done deviant issues or deviant behaviors and this reaction sometimes can also be used to explain why deviance in society. Uh, sociologists study why people violate the laws or the norms and how the society reacts to such, uh, such activities. Robert Martin, for example, suggests that deviant behavior is a result of the strain that individuals may experience uh, when uh, within a community or a society when the society does not provide the means for them to achieve uh, culturally valued goals. So Martin's, uh, so, sorry, Martin um, argues or reasons that when a society fails people in the way that it fails to provide a, a circumstance, a framework for them to achieve culturally um, valued goals, then these people would uh, in a way rebel or they engage in deviant behavior or sometimes even in criminal acts as a way to oppose and to ensure that they get uh, what they desire or what they deem fit for them. And this, uh, he used the, uh, the concept of the issue of economic success as an example to explain uh, why the strain, strain theory uh, can 
be used to explain um, why there's deviance in, uh, in society. Um, other uh, sociologists include the structural, structural, structural functionalist theorists who also look at uh, deviance as a normal way of happening, as something that is not, should not be taken as abnormal because according to functionalism, even deviance has a function within society. So they categorize such certain functions of deviance that may be important to, for society, in order for society to grow. And they say that uh, deviance is important or has a function, including, for instance, it serves to help uh, clarify the moral boundaries in regards to what is morally accepted and what is not morally accepted. And by so doing, it has a purpose or it has a function within the social fabric. And then they also say that deviance uh, also has a function of promoting conformity among the non-deviant people. So if you see that uh, people are regarded as, be, as being deviant and maybe in so doing society scorns them or society looks at them in a negative perspective, then that should um, be or should set boundaries to say that, well, maybe that is not something I should be doing. I should be conforming to what society wants so that I can be among the good uh, children, so to speak, of society. Uh, structural functionalists, functionalists also say that deviance has a function of increasing solidarity among, um, among the non deviants. So that uh, when people have been characterized as deviant, as misfit, as, you know, outcasts out there, then they within themselves build a bond. And that bond is also a function for society according to structural functionalists. Moreover, they also say that uh, deviance also promotes social change. For example, when you, if you can recall back when you, when they were, you were talking about the um, French Revolution, and we talked about all these issues of civil dis disabilities and things like that, and how they promoted or led towards social change. So uh, according to structural functionalists, they say that that is also an important function within society or of trying to understand society. Hence, deviance has an important function within society. And finally, they say that also deviance has a function of promoting or, or, or of helping society to reevaluate some of the things that they're doing in order it, it, it in a way it provides some sort of checks in order to see that what needs to be improved and therefore society will we improve that would be better because of the deviance that um, has happened within society and hence the importance or the functions that structural functions see as being important within sociology. Uh, so they continue to say that uh, deviance sets an example of what is an acceptable behavior so that people may learn from this not to try and emulate that because this is already something that has been put out there for you not to do. Remember the do's and don'ts of society. And then the also that um, deviance provides guidelines for behavior that is necessary to main, in order to maintain social order. Remember, functionalists are preoccupied with the issue of maintaining social order, social unity within social societies. And also that the uh, deviance binds people together, uh, whereby they have a common uh, sort of behavior. And then it also provides jobs for those who deal with deviance. Imagine that um, if there were no deviance, then maybe people who do counseling, who are involved with delinquency, de deviance, delinquencies, then such people will, have, will be out of jobs. So deviance has a function or is important for society because it, it creates um, jobs for some people. Obviously, we've also mentioned that uh, deviance can signal problems in a society that may need addressing. And in, in such a way, it uh, promotes or stimulates social change also an important um, attribute for functionalists, uh, uh, structural functionalist societies. And then also that deviance opens society to new and creative 
ways of thinking. Now, another uh, sociologist that was uh, very interested with uh, the issue of deviance is Robert Martin, who we mentioned that he used the strain theory to explain deviance. For, for, for Robert Martin, he says that every society, their culturally defined goals and socially approved means of achieving these goals, especially in the economic arena. But in every society, <clears throat> we can find strains between the culturally defined goals and the socially approved means of attaining these goals. This tends to create an imbalance. And this imbalance, which Martin calls anomie, is illustrated in a typology which um, can be seen in this uh, sort of figure here, whereby here are the means and here are the goals. And some of the means, uh, how to attain the goals, there's, you can either use acceptably, accept, accept, acceptably means, or you can reject some of the issues that you find um, are not really giving you what you want. And then, in, in, in substitute of this rejection, then you also have um, create something else. Uh, when he talks about conformity, conformity means simply embracing what a society defines as success. Therefore, if you adhere to this uh, to these issues or things that society labels or understands as being uh, success or how to achieve success, then it means you have conformed to what society has prescribed. But sometimes we, we have innovations and we also know that there is always some sort of rejection to innovation as innovation is a new way of looking at things or a new things being brought into the society. So with innovation, you find that some, sometimes people need to use, um, can use illegal means in order to achieve their goal. If the goal is to achieve economic success, then sometimes people may, may tend to use illegal means just because they're interested in the goal and not you know, the means towards reaching the goal. Um, for ritualism, he says that sometimes a society has you know, these strict culturally prescribed rules. And even though some of these rules may not uh, appeal to all individuals, the individuals who uh, may either stick to these rules and not end up not achieving their uh, uh, dreams of attaining economic success, whereby they give up hope, and sometimes they may even uh, forego their whole means towards achieving that because these uh, rules tend to be very strict and do not work for them. Uh, and when that happens, Martin says society goes through some something that. Uh, can be looked at as or can be seen as to be retrieve, re retreat, retreatism, you retreat. By retreating, you either give up the goals or you even give up the means or you give up both the goals and the means. And when that happens, you have re rebelled and when you rebel, the rejection, uh, re you rebel by rejecting society and the approved ideas of what success is or can be or can is defined as. And in the, in, the, in the cause of this rejection or in the cause of this rebellion, um, you replace what attaining success or even maybe the definition of what success is with alternative strategies for attaining the new goals that society has put in place for them. Hence the importance of deviance in sociology. You remember the conflict perspective when we were talking about Karl Marx? So conflict perspective also has um, a way of looking at deviance. For them, deviance um, is a behavior that results from the social, political, economic, and sometimes even material conflict within society. Uh, it can be used to explain why some people resort to criminal trades simply in order to survive in an economically and equal society. So for conflict theorists, deviance is a result of social inequality. Whereby, for example, you find the elites want to maintain control 
and so they define what deviant is uh, to benefit themselves and to deflect the attention from their own uh, behavior. Uh, the greater, according to conflict theorists, they say that the greater the power differentials and inequalities, especially among and within classes, then the greater the conflict in a society. And this, they've used the capitalist power arrangements to explain more on the importance for why deviance happens in society according to the conflict perspective. Other theorists that have also been interested in uh, explaining the theory of deviance include the labeling theorists. The labeling theory of deviance look, sees that behavior in itself is not intrinsically deviant, but it can become deviant because it has been labeled as such by society. So society is the one who defines or labels what is deviant and in so doing imposes sanctions for, what, uh, for such uh, deviant behavior. Individuals who engage in primary deviance are sometimes not labeled, but those who engage in secondary deviance are. And being labeled, according to labeling theory, reinforces deviant behavior in a number of ways, including first, it increases alienation. You know, the people who have already been labeled as being deviant, they some, somehow tend to form a bond and then the, this, uh, they are there, because they're alienated from the larger group, then they tend to increase the issues of alienation, also tends to increase the issue of uh, deviance. And also the labeling theorists say that forcing, um, uh, labeling theory re reinforces deviant by forcing um, in, uh, forcing interaction with deviant peers because now they, they, they already have a group or they have a group, uh, um, a clique or a caste. So these people together they form a bond in which they create their own peers and then they continue with their deviant behavior. And finally they say that especially for juveniles, for young, uh, young people, this also creates an opportunity for them to create a certain value system and a certain value um, and to uphold deviant status as being something that is, you know, different and we know that in, during the, the period of developing and acquiring and trying to get some individual recognition out there, sometimes people tend to do things that uh, society does not necessarily agree or accept. There's also the feminist theorists also who have a take on deviance in society. And for them, they say that deviance is due to patriarchy. And patriarchy, they say, is a result of the capitalist system, especially because men and women are regarded as different or they come into, into the economic, political, and social playing field from different um, from a different uh, play field. The, the, the play field is not level, whereby you find that women are disadvantaged just because they are women. And this is um, due to patriarchy and what patriarchy does for women. And then that, according to feminist theorists, is a reason for deviance. They also say that uh, deviance uh, is caused by the gender division of labor within society. Uh, and also socialization of children, because children, as we, 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 we learned when we were looking at socialization, they learn from, the, from their elders, they learn from the other generation. So if a child has been socialized in a particular way, for example, we say that girl children are, are socialized to play with dolls because that is preparing them for roles of being mothers, sisters, carers within the society, whereby boys are allowed to go and play outside, Therefore, they are, their minds, their young minds are made to explore, to learn things. And then they are also given different set of toys which make them to be prepared for certain roles within society. And hence, this socialization process is also a way in which uh, deviance is impacted from, from a young age. Uh, according to feminist theories, also cultural attitudes and crimes against women 
are based on the status of the women within that society. And from the culture, from the feminist perspective, we know that uh, culturally women are usually, they, they occupy the lowest of the stratas of society. And even some of the cultures tend to really put women down to a point where some women or some societies and some cultures do not allow women to do certain activities, not because they are not able, they are not unable to do them, but just because they are women, then it is frowned upon for a woman to do certain activities, and hence uh, the deviance according to feminist theorists. The interactionists or the symbolic interactionists, for them, deviance is something that occurs every day. It occurs in everyday society when people interact with each other, giving meaning to their interaction. And in so doing, they say deviance is learned, just like any other behavior can be learned out there through group interaction and sometimes through intercommunication. And they say also the techniques, the attitudes, and even the motivation justifying deviant behavior is also something that is learned. And sometimes they say that this learning, especially this association, when it, if, if it occurs early in life, or if it occurs among with people that are regarded in high esteem, then the influence and the impact of deviance tends to be higher as compared to if uh, they come into contact with this interaction at a much uh, later stage in their lives. Now we talked a lot in great detail about deviance, why it happens. We also tried to look at some of the theorists that uh, have tried to understand and explain why deviance is important in society. Now let's look at the second concept of this part of the lecture series, which is social inequality. Social inequality can be explained using social stratification. And we say that social stratification is a system of ranking categories of people in a hierarchy. Some groups have greater status, greater power and wealth than others. And these differences within society or within the social structure, stratas or structure, social stratification uh, are based on, according to the, some of the, the principles in sociology on four major uh, principles. First being that stratification is a, is a trait in society and is not a reflection of individual differences. Sometimes you find yourself, remember when we were talking about um, the example of India and the caste system, you just find yourself there, not because you are necessarily incapable as an individual, but because it is something that you know society has already prescribed for it. And they also say that uh, stratification persists over generation. Remember when you're talking about socialization and how these things are learned and carried forward from generation to generation. And then they also say stratification is universal, but it takes different forms in different societies. That in, across the whole world, there are usually social stratification, there are usually issues of social inequality, but it takes different forms in different societies. And fourth, they say that stratification involves the issue of inequality, which is rooted in the society's philosophy. So social inequality, some of the theories that or viewpoints that have been used to understand and explain social inequality, again, we go back to structural functionalists. For them, social inequality plays a vital role in the smooth operation of society. Remember when you said that, when they say that uh, once society developed and is, uh, decided to be, uh, and it became more specialized, then there were all these uh, different specializations were important towards the growth and development of the society. Hence, um, inequality also plays a vital role in the smooth operation of, of society because each uh, group or each category has a role or a function to play within our society. And then there's the Davis Moore thesis, Davis and Moore thesis, that states that social stratification has beneficial consequences uh, because 
uh, some of the difficult jobs require some of the highest rewards and uh, motivation to do. For example, they say that to be a brain surgery, one needs to be paid high and to also be motivated as compared to maybe doing activities that anybody can do, including maybe lowering the lawn, the, uh, mowing the lawn, or even, you know, washing dishes, something that anybody can do. And hence, the, the, the issue of social inequality, whereby people have to be unequal because of the activities and the tasks that they do for society. Uh, then there's the development and modernization theorists who argue that um, the poor nations are poor because they hold on to their traditional attitudes, their traditional beliefs, and their, all their technology is also not advanced, and some of their economic systems and their governments are held on to these traditions that don't necessarily make them grow, hence the inequality between the poor and the rich nations. That is according to the uh, modernization theory. The dependency theorists, on the other hand, say that, well, this inequality is due to the issue of colonialism and neocolonialism and the effects of colonialism. We shall not go into more details about uh, all these things because I'm sure maybe you have had access to learn about all this in other courses or you will be able to learn about this, more of this, as you advance more within the other branches of sociology. Remember, this is just the introduction to sociology part that tends to touch on all basic uh, aspects for you to, in order to make you be aware and understand more of the other sociological uh, disciplines and, and branches that you will be coming into contact in future. And then, then the, there's the world systems theory that says that uh, countries are uh, Poverty is in relation to the global economy, so uh, there are also other arguments that pertain to this, but uh, as I said, we are not going to delve into details, looking at social inequality and some of the theoretical points of view. Stratification and inequality. What joins or what combines the two, or why are the two together? Stratification refers to the range of social, social classes that result from variation in socioeconomic status. When individuals or groups occupy unequal positions in society based on the socioeconomic factors, this is called social stratification. Inequality occurs when persons or positions in the society or the social hierarchy are tied to different to different access to resources, and they also depend on different, different differences in wealth. For example, a wealthy person may receive a higher quality medical care as compared to a poor person. They may even have greater access to foods and nutrition as compared to a poor person, and they may be able to att attend even higher caliber schools as compared to a poor person. So all these material resources that are not distributed equally between the poor and the rich, and the economic statuses that each, each one hold, all of this uh, can be used to explain why there's inequality in society. While stratification is associated with the socioeconomic status, society is also stratified according to other statuses, including maybe race or even gender, whereby we find that a socioeconomic status shapes the unequal distribution of resources, unequal distribution of opportunities, unequal distribution of privileges among individuals. For example, uh, women are less likely to receive job promotions than men, this, uh, again, if you look at most, more, more, most of the cultural, uh, society, cultural issues within society, we, can, we tend to come, this is something that is somehow repeated across uh, nations, across communities, across societies. Uh, in the U.S., for example, where there's a heavily, where, where the, the U.S. is heavily uh, racially segregated between the 
blacks and the and the whites, you find that there are certain neighborhoods and there are certain racial minorities, including the blacks and the Hispanic. These people are less likely to have access to good quality schools or even uh, to access to other issues that the white people necessarily enjoy just by virtue of being white. So the key aspects of social stratification are class, status, as well as power. If we again stay with the, within the USA and we try to look at some of the inequalities pertained within the USA, you will find that um, although most people tend to be affluent within the USA as compared to maybe uh, our countries, our, our countries including uh, Tanzania, we find that the distribution of wealth and income is still highly unequal. And maybe between the early years of the 70s to the late 80s, this gap between the rich and the poor kept growing wider. Globalization is said to be a, a cause and to have caused some, some of these sharp increases between the working, working class families and the drop in the economy. Ordinary workers, minorities, and single parents' family has happened to be at the bottom of the strata of this as inequality within the US. And some of the research that has been done on social mobility tend to suggest that um, the effect of education uh, opportunities um, have led to increase in inequality, especially due to globalization, as we have already said, and the spread of the new technologies, whereby the access to technologies also tends to make other people improve their lives and sometimes the competition for the top paying jobs, which we have said sometimes are inaccessible to people of minority or people of color. Now let's try and uh, just focus a little bit on gender inequalities as, being, as trying to expound on the concept of inequality. Uh, gender inequality or gender discrimination sometimes happens in various aspects, in various ways. Remember, uh, the, uh, feminist theory said that this is because of patriarchy and how the capitalist system somehow has enabled women to occupy, women and the poor to occupy a lesser position within society. And that position also deprives them of certain privileges, certain resources and certain activities and uh, privileges. So gender discrimination, for example, within the health setting, we also find that sometimes uh, decisions and policies are made by those who have power and those who make decisions. And women, unfortunately, due to the fact that most of them would not be in status uh, in positions of decision making, uh, very few of them are in decisions of power. So within that, uh, a scenario you find that most of the policies, most of, most of the decisions are made by those in power and this inequitably being made. So you find that sometimes even the decisions that they make, maybe sometimes even in regards to healthcare, may not necessarily favor women, whereby we know that women uh, have um, a more propensity towards healthcare because of they are the ones who will be mothers, they will be taking care of their children, they will be taking care of the family. And also as women, they have uh, health concerns that are more as compared to the men. For example, they would need contraceptives, they would need um, reproductive health um, services, they would need um, information and you know to do with nutrition and things like that. So these are things that um, sometimes for a decision making policies and places do not take as being important because for them it is not something they would normally think about or consider and hence we find that uh, when you look at the health setting and even sometimes uh, historically even the working people who are working within the health uh, system you find that women would be regarded or would be put down to, to towards doing jobs like uh, being nurses and uh, men would be doctors and these are also all of these 
combined show some of the gender inequalities within the healthcare system, healthcare settings. Uh, gender inequalities can also be seen in regards to access to employ employment. Most of the time, again, uh, re referring to the patriarchal system, you find that women or girls don't have the access to education and when they do, they tend to leave early and sometimes when it, it's a matter of trading who should go to school, who shouldn't go because of poverty, you find that a girl child is made to stay at home and to take care of the, of the home and to help the mother because uh, they don't see that necessarily edu educating a girl child may be an important activity or an important issue. Although obviously this perception is now largely changing and has changed in more, many, many, many societies. But having that um, base whereby because of uh, the gender and the cultural issues within the home, the girls are the ones who will study to take less time to study because they will be doing other activities that are regarded for their female gender. And even when it comes to paying fees, if the, the parents are poor, they obviously um, probably pay for the boy as compared to paying for the girl. And all these things make women to be in a lesser educated um, environment as compared to the men and hence when it comes to employment and employment necessarily focuses on the qualities the characteristics the achievement the certificates because women would not have this in there within them then they would not be employed in high paying jobs as a result they'll get to be employed in lower paying status jobs doing things that they would normally be doing at home maybe cleaning sweeping uh, making tea and you know other secretarial and jobs that are not necessarily highly paid because they are not highly skilled. And sometimes also due to the fact that women are the ones who have to take care of children, they choose uh, jobs that have greater flexibility and in some cases such jobs tend to have lower pay. And hence this gender pay gap that uh, is visible within the workplace is also say can also be a way of discussing and underline analyze and understanding issues of gender inequality so uh, inequality is also in, in professional success has, has also been an important matter one issue that women have had to grapple with for example issue of maternity leave issue of gender roles has made sometimes women not to be considered for maybe even professional success or maybe for big top jobs because you know they, it's, it's assumed that they will tend to leave for maternity leave or because of their gender role sometimes they don't they don't seem to be as efficient as their male counterparts so in summary in this lecture we have talked a lot about deviance about social control and about social inequality We've seen what deviance is and who are considered to be deviant and some of the theories that have been used to explain the issue of deviance in society and, uh, you know, issues of social control. We also discussed about social inequality and social stratification and st cited examples of inequality both within the developing and the developed worlds and we discussed about the issue of gender inequality so um, I hope these lectures in the introductory series to sociology have been able to lay a foundation towards understanding other branches of sociology as this has been an introductory part of the introducing you to sociology which as, as you can recall from the lecture series is something that is really wide and it looks at many many aspects of the social life and human development. So thank you for your attention.